Warning, if you missed the first episode or the content in there wasn't enough of a warning on its own, bad language, bad jokes, basic bitches, and overly sexual humor will follow. Also, there will be spoilers for chapter 5 through 11 of Aragon, book one of The Inherent Cycle by Christopher Paolini. Listen at your own risk. Is this a podcast or is this just fantasy? We're just two nerds. So join us if you want to nerd out. Time to start the podcast and see. And see. anyway, here's the show. Hey, readers, I'm Dane Patterson, the host with absolutely no hunches that this weird storyteller guy in town is more than he seems. No, not that guy. Not for a second. Just a regular ass guy. And I'm Jackie Lanier. And is this a podcast or is this just fantasy? The podcast where our thighs might be shredded from riding bareback on dragons. But at least we didn't show up too late to save the farm. Jax, I, I think you need to keep reading. Why? Some Something bad happened? We'll, we'll get to it in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> if you'd like to support the show, there's a link in the show notes to our social media accounts at Is This Just Fantasy Pod on TikTok or at Just Fantasy Pod on Insta and Twitter. Jax and I would also be super appreciative if you rated and reviewed our show on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcast. It really matters to new podcasts and we it would help us be able to spend more time, you know, reading fantasy novels. Yeah, I think we clearly need to spend more time doing. <laughs> Not quite enough just yet. <laughs> My wife is going to love that. <laughs> yes. Actually, the only thing I do know about algorithms is that the algorithm that gets your podcast in front of new listeners is really dependent on Apple podcast reviews. So I do know that would be very helpful if you could do it. And there endeth <laughs> my algorithm. diatribe on <laughs> algorithms. I don't know anything else about it. Don't ask me questions. Do not at me. Um, but also, we would love if you could visit us at is this just fantasypod.com. Really rolls off the tongue there. Silky spoon. Uh, yeah, to get our sweet merch and find our entire extensive episode archive. One whole episode. That's us. One episode. <laughs> <laughs> so. Like we said on the last episode, we do want to start out by summarizing what we covered last time before we dive into some summaries of the chapters that we read for this week. So let's go over some quick Cliff's notes from the prologue through chapter four of let's Aragon. Yes. So after an epic forest annihilating battle between magical elves, monstrous urgles, a horrifying, terrifying shade, <laughs> we smash cut to everyone's favorite bean farmer, Kevin. Oh, Jackie, you guys stop reading from Christopher Polly's original manuscript? I don't know. Kevin's a great name. Kevin, our producer, Kevin, the bean farmer. <laughs> I'm kind of into it. It's I'm just an originalist, Dane. Put me <laughs> on the Supreme Court. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we see Aragon find a mysterious, beautiful hollow to everyone's great surprise. Oh my God, shocking. <laughs> Stone in the sinister local mountain range, the Spine. He takes this loot back to his small village, Carvajal, and we meet a collection of the locals, namely the hottest girl in town, Katrina, the big baller blacksmith, Horst, and the inexplicably cranky butcher, Sloan. And Just an asshole. Yeah, that guy's a huge dick. <laughs> No other notes. As Aragon heads back home to his bean farm, we meet his questionably shady, just very strangely written father, Uncle Garrow, and his horny as fuck brother, cousin Roran. <laughs> and we get some idyllic scenes of their vegetable farming life through the turn of the season to winter as the local or the annual trading caravan mm -hmm. finally makes it to the village and brings the big city party life to these small town boys with big dreams. <laughs> oh my gosh. But the traders bring hot pies and hotter gossip about how shitty the rest of the country is doing right now, like just chaos yeah. out in Allegasia. But don't worry, the not at all evil king of the empire is going to save everybody. He's our guy. Gal's yeah. our guy. And if you hear otherwise, that's just terrorist propaganda. Thanks, Obama. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's just the stuff that's being put out by the real bad guys and their network of bad spies, the Varden. Mm -hmm. And before you forget about that hollow stone that we had no way of finding out anything else about, boom, that bitch hatches. It was an egg. The <laughs> whole time? Seen it coming the whole time, dude. Wow. <laughs> and that's where we left our crew. So before we get into what actually happened in these next seven chapters here, <laughs> uh, how are you feeling, Dane? I'm having fun. Yeah. I, I like Carvajal. Yes. Yeah. It's fun to go back, fun to like run it back, get to meet everybody again. I feel like the more we get to learn about all the villagers, the more I'm really solidifying opinions about some people. Yeah. I got some strong opinions. Horse, <laughs> horse is dope. Yes. Katrina seems cool. Sloan, not a good guy. No. Murloc, not. 
Murlocs is an enigma to me. What about Garrow? You decided, made a final call on that guy yet, or <laughs> jury's out? A jury's out. <laughs> I don't know. There's something off about him. Yeah, that's fair. How are you feeling about podcasting so far? I'm liking it. Yeah? I think, you know, when you have a good partner like Kevin, things <laughs> just like roll together. Hey, I you said it I mean? once. I'll say it again. Kevin is keeping this ship on the rails, <laughs> as on the rails as it's ever gonna be no i'm having fun um it's been really cool doing it with you so far and i just like this is crazy like yeah. the whole thing we're doing is i guess crazy. we've been talking about it for so long clearly we like to talk <laughs> kind of a toxic <laughs> trait we share <laughs> i don't know what you're talking about <laughs> so it's yeah it's been really fun to see it kind of come to life yeah it's and i think we can't talk non-stop here we have to move on I because guess. now there's chapter summaries to do if you're into that sort of that's thing. that's what people are here for so buckle up are people here I don't know. No one's, no one's here. Uh, <laughs> chapter five, awakening. Uh, we open the chapter to find that our little bean farmer didn't just find a dumb hollow stone in the spooky spine. No, no, no. It's a dragon's egg. Huh. The dragon is insanely beautiful and is described as being a stunning blue color with scales that look and feel gem-like. <laughs> it has white sharp spikes running down its neck and two white horns, large deadly teeth and serrated claws and thin papery wings incredible it's described as deadly uh kind of from the get-go yeah. but aragon like a foot long and a death machine <laughs> yeah death machine foot long all those things i told you are there aragon immediately touches it <laughs> um, yeah regardless of the risk that's a teen boy right there yeah. it's like oh i like it poke <laughs> no risk no reward in the farming business <laughs> um the moment he does that his palm gets marked with a silver oval um, so a 15 year old already has a sick silver tattoo. I'm kind of jealous. Um, it has also caused his whole body to hurt. Um, pretty bad. He's got a burning feeling all over. Uh, yeah. So I'm hoping that there's like a, like an antibiotic or maybe topical cream that he can like, put on that. Um, right after getting his free tattoo, he immediately notices that he can feel hunger and emotions that aren't his. So Aragorn can now feel his new dragon's emotions and hear its thoughts. So to recap, a dragon is born. He has a new tattoo. His whole body has been racked in pain. <laughs> and he now has a mind and soul meld with a dragon. And Aragorn's first thought is that he'll just handle all this later. <laughs> I think this is something that might be some pretty serious insight into this guy's character <laughs> because it's, I mean, to be fair, it's the middle of the night, but yeah. he's just like, ah, if I ignore it, it'll go away. He's got a death monster. He's like, all right, you stay there. Good night. I really got to, really got to get another couple hours in tonight. Otherwise I'm going to be sleepy in the morning. <laughs> it's like my guy, you you're, have a dragon. You're 15. Yeah. Deal with it. Uh, well, anyway, whatever the things you ignore, just like stop being problems. Well, like I, parking tickets. Maybe he's down. Cause his second thought is that the insane murder wizard, dragon riding King, uh, if he found out about him, uh, and his dragon and his family, uh, he would be in the danger zone if they <laughs> didn't happily and immediately start working for a King as a new rider. Uh, yeah. But he'll deal with that later in the morning. <laughs> uh, he goes to, uh, in, the, in the morning, he goes to hide his new mind-linked dragon, uh, Bessie in the forest. And the uh, rest of the chapter is really just one big montage of him building several structures. This bean boy is handy A. F. Yes, I think we can safely say that Aragon and his dragon pal are card-carrying members of Tiny Home Nation. They're like out in the forest just building cabin after cabin. Habitat for Druman. <laughs> okay, well, that was rough. Let's try <laughs> oh, uh-oh. Habitat for Drek. Academy? I hate it here. Oh, don't know. <laughs> anyway, well, while he's building with his hands, uh, his little dragon grows very quickly, and it turns into kind of a killing machine. Aragon reflects to himself several times how scary this now larger than wolf-sized dragon is. Yeah. Um, also growing is the mind and emotional like mind meld between them. It's pretty wild because they can maintain it while they are apart at a fairly large distance from each other. Yeah, like three leagues to be exact a common unit of measurement oh, for yes. me in my life which you know me i know as a fantasy nerd is like nine miles but you know he anyway. looked it up earlier this morning i don't know can't confirm about. this I'm leads out him. to aragon <laughs> coming to the conclusion that his dragon feels like a part of his own self and he's becoming almost one with this dragon. it's actually really cool yeah they're slowly kind of melding together which i have to say is going to be a bummer when his first pet dies what um, do you mean I, well i don't know how old dragons live pets don't die dane oh jackie my my little BB Wally. Eventually, <laughs> Aragon gets to a point where he he knows his dragon isn't a pet, and they start communicating directly. He decides it's an equal relationship at the end of this chapter, and the dragon starts hunting on its own. And Aragon ends this chapter worried it is probably going to be found out with how big it is. And I have to say, 
I think it's a good, I think it's a worry he should start worrying about. Yeah, that's a safe, yeah. <laughs> safe thing to be a little concerned about. But that does lead us to chapter six titled T for Two. <laughs> Eric Khan goes to that very ordinary storyteller in town, Brahm. Regular guy. Yeah, to ask some not at all suspicious questions about dragons, the riders, kind of all that stuff that we talked about in the story that Brom told in the last episode section. Some clarifying questions. Yeah, yeah. and Aragon, he goes thinking like, oh, I'm just going to be very subtle. He's Low not key. even going to know. Yeah. Aragon has zero chill. Like, <laughs> he's so obvious. It's insane. And I know we're going to take a deep dive later in this episode into a lot of the info that Brom yes. tells Aragon specifically, but I think it's important to note just one thing quickly mm -hmm. in yeah. the strangest coincidence of all time, Aragon happens to share a name with the very first dragon rider. And I don't think that's important or will come up at any point. And that's the end of my chapter summary. Yeah. That's probably just like a really small detail. We Super don't really crazy. need to pay attention to. Nah. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, it is what it is. What's uh, the next chapter called? <laughs> Speaking of names, a name of power. Weird. Chapter seven, a name of power. Uh, this chapter starts with Aragon getting some news that upsets him pretty bad. Um, his brother, cousin, Roran, explains to Aragon that he has to leave. He's going to be leaving Carpahal because uh, he's got to go to Miller Dempton, mm. uh, who has a job for him uh, because Roy needs some cash because he wants to marry <laughs> the prettiest girl in town. Got to keep those assets liquid, man. Yeah. You can't have all your stock tied up in beans. You can't, yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it's a problem. You can't get married like that. He might be a lagoon man, but he's also into this lady. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you could say he wants to afford some choice meats from the butcher. Oh, oh, <laughs> you, you could. <laughs> <laughs> but would you about a character in a book who's 16? That's oh, a thing that's you would well. Say? Now you've made it weird. Uh, his plan is he <laughs> that's leaves. That's what I'm here for. <laughs> his plan is he leaves for the winter and then comes back because um, he wants to make a house by spring. This guy's got plans. Ring by spring. When yeah. does he go to a very Christian college? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Married by spring sounds very responsible and like a good first step to me. But Aragon is just mad. His brother cousin is leaving. Angst. Yeah, I mean he's really upset. He's also super worried about what Garrow is going to say. I think he's worried for Roran. Let's just like, what is up with Garrow? Yeah. Like blink once, Aragon, if he hits you. Like just. <laughs> yeah, so his first reaction is like, oh, Garrow's going to murder Roran when he tells him he's leaving. You're not going to get married, bro. You're going to get buried, bro. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> Ultimately, he goes into the forest where he talks with Safira, um, like just to talk about it, um, knowing for sure his talk with Brom, that she is like as smart as him. Yeah. Um, she reveals some, some humor here as they go through a bunch of male dragon names and Aragon learns that she's a she. It's one of my all time favorite lines in this entire book series, four books, thousands of pages. Yes. An absolutely iconic moment for me is Aragon <laughs> reading all these names and she's like, I don't like that name. I don't like that name. He can tell she's like kind of laughing yeah. and he really has to take a beat until he's like, Oh, you're a she. You're a she. <laughs> it He's is just such funny. a goof. <laughs> yeah. Uh, she reveals some dry humor there. Um, so it's official, Jax. Uh, so far, every female presented is described as a babe. Oh, Zephira including the is dragon. a hot dragon. <laughs> Great. Uh, anyway, Aragon <laughs> mostly just whines in this chapter and then names his dragon. I love the name Safira. I think he picked well, but we have Safira, the hot dragon. <laughs> That's what we have. We're, that makes sense. Yeah. I could see that. <laughs> that takes us to chapter eight, titled A Miller to Be. We start this chapter with Roran telling Garrow about his plan to work at the Theronsford Mill. And I love this exchange over dinner because it's really crystallizing why I'm getting such a weird vibe from Garrow. <laughs> oh, really? He's Yes, he's described as finishing his mouthful of food with deliberate slowness. And I don't know about you, but people who chew at that level of intensity are like people who don't like cheese to me. Do like, you, I don't trust them. I don't like it. There's nothing I connect to right. in that situation. Do you think he made like non-breaking eye contact? Absolutely. With, like, just like... <laughs> yes. Chewing, eye contact. <laughs> All the people out there who hate to listen to people chew, you're welcome for that audio. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh, Shady eating habits notwithstanding, Garrow's actually into Roran's plan and is excited for his son to finally put a ring on it. So, like, he's he's like, oh, fun, we're going to expand the family. <laughs> I remember reading this as a kid. This surprised me because of the lead up with Aragon. Like, I thought... You really Gar thought like, Roran was going to get his ass handed to yeah, him. Yeah, I was like, oh, man, Roran's going to be in trouble. Yeah. No. So we were saved from that, thank God. But Garrow, knowing that Roran's going to leave for the season, kind of gets his guys in gear. Um to prepare the farm, get everything ready so that he and Aragon can handle it on their own. And 
if Garo is actually taking this huge change pretty well, Aragon most decidedly is not. No. <laughs> They're all working extra hard on the farm together, but Aragon's super angsty, refuses to do more than, quote, curtly answering direct questions. So they're like <sighs> putting in hours day after day and Aragon's just like, sure, whatever. I'll do it. Like Fine. Classic teen guy here. I'll get the beans, I guess. Yeah, being just a touch of an asshole. <laughs> but his frustration on the farm actually ends up bonding him closer to Safira because she's instinctively understanding him in a way that his family's not and he clearly is not communicating <laughs> to them. <laughs> yes. Um, and she's providing a host of new experiences to distract him from having to feel any real emotion which love that journey for him <laughs> and she's now tall enough or taller than Aragon and large enough for him to sit on her shoulder so that's kind of where we are size and development wise super cool and we do see Aragon bitch out of two things at the end of this chapter one he doesn't tell Garrow and Roran about Sephiro which he I mean Probably. If you ask me, probably should do that at some point. Yeah. And he doesn't talk to Roran on the eve of his departure. Like late at night, Ar Aragon's like walking through the house on his way to Roran's room to like bid his closer than a brother yeah. cousin goodbye for months on end, the longest they've ever been apart. Yeah. And he walks up to the door, like raises his hand to knock and then walks back to his room. You know what I imagine? I imagine he goes to his room and then Roran picks out his head in the hall. And then he goes to Aragon's room. And then he raises up his Straight hand. up just a scene from a rom-com. <laughs> yeah. And then he goes, no. And then he walks in and then Aragon pokes out. And then shakes his head. Yeah. Anyway. Anyway. <laughs> Chapter 9. Strangers in Carvajal. It, uh, it is the day Roran has to leave. It's very sad. Uh, Garrow first gives Roran some money. Um, some cold, hard cashola, uh, <laughs> which is super nice. Yeah. Yeah. He follows it up with an offbeat pep talk to his son and his son, nephew, Aragon. <laughs> and I'm actually going to read it directly because it's pretty good. And um, also as I just, I think it's odd advice a little bit. It's good yeah. advice and odd advice. So let's, let's just read it. Here it goes. He says, first, let no one rule your mind or body. Take special care that your thoughts remain unfettered. One may be a free man and yet be bound tighter than a slave. Give men your ear, but not your heart. Show respect for those in power, but don't follow them blindly. Judge with logic and reason, but comment not. I think... I think the king would disagree with some of these fatherly advice. <laughs> That's true. In, in the absolute monarchy they live in. Yeah. It's like the Toltarian regime they live yes. in. Uh, I, question, don't follow blindly. That's, yeah. a, that's some interesting advice. I feel for, like King Gal would just be like, um, no, follow blindly. You that's should what follow we blind. That's what the whole thing is. It's kind of the vibe. Also, I do love the very last piece of advice that's like, have all your own thoughts. Be judgy as hell, but keep your fucking mouth shut. <laughs> <laughs> Snitches get stitches. Just chew slowly and stare at him and think it. You don't actually say it. Yes. Clearly <laughs> keys for success. Major key alert. <laughs> yeah, I was actually surprised. Garo says bye to his son and in a cool dad move, like lets the brother cousins have some time alone while they yeah. while they walk the ten <laughs> miles. Ten miles. That's too long to be walking yeah. in and out of town every time. To the village to talk it out. Um, once in town, Roran meets his new boss, while uh, who you know Aragon is very petty. He just does not <laughs> like this guy. Uh, blacksmith and total bro horse pulls up Aragon aside. He just like comes up, pulls up. He's like, "Hey, Aragon, come here!" And quickly tells Aragon that two odd cloak strangers who give horse bad vibes <laughs> are looking for a stone that looks exactly like the one Aragon has. <gasps> mm, uh oh. Uh oh. Aragon instantly starts to freak out, not playing it very cool at all. And he quickly says goodbye to his brother, cousin Roran, uh, because he's kind of panicking. Uh, yeah. He tries to sneak away through the streets and alleyways when he finds himself near the butcher's house. Uh, he hears fucking resident asshole <laughs> and all around bad dude yes. who yells at teenagers, Sloan, telling two mysterious cloaked figures with voices that sound like, quoting here, creeping decay. What he saw, that he saw the stone three months ago. Dude, come on. I know. Like, have a little self-awareness, Sloan. Like, these guys clearly are up to no good. And unless you're actively trying to get Aragon killed, maybe just keep your shit to yourself for I'm, once. Yeah, he's a snitch of all things, too. Yeah. <sighs> it's important to know that things turn up here. All right? Uh, the two cloaked figures totally threaten Sloan's life. 
So these people, whoever they are, seem like they will kill over this dragon egg. The two figures leave Sloane's place and in the street make immediate eye contact with Aragon. Oh, like, so creepy. Yeah. Like, this is this was tense. Up. Yeah. Aragon tries to run, but he's frozen for some reason in terror and they start to walk towards him. I'm thinking like merge all wheel of time yeah. ring wrath lord of the rings like cool dark vader star wars walk it's like that moment yeah. you know what i mean uh and aragon tries to run uh and he's like totally done for when brahm shows up and the strangers leave when they see brahm and they tell this old storyteller really like seems like he's just an old regular normal dude here yeah i mean I'm just a regular person, and when I walk down the street, people also run. Yeah. So Eric, <laughs> right? He just, like, run away. Yeah. Aragon falls to the ground, and Brom helps and tells him to head home. Aragon is finally suspicious of Brom, thank God, and asks why Brom <laughs> was trying to find him. And Brom throws it back at him <laughs> when he's asked Aragon if he remembers the, like, traitor he lied to. Uh, to Rom about and it's really funny because Aragon is a horrible liar here. Yes, Brom like immediately is like, well, I just wanted to ask some more questions about that lie you told me a few days ago. You know, the traitor. Yeah, and Aragon's like, who? What? what, what? Yeah. He almost gets caught and he was like, wait, what? Which traitor? It's, it's great. It, I don't know. It's great. Uh, Brom also sees his silver palm. I don't know what it is, but something's up with the Brom dude. Uh, this chapter ends with Aragon running out of Carvajal. Like, you yeah. know, like, oh, he's worried. Yes, I would be too, dude. <laughs> yeah, it's creepy. <laughs> yeah, those strangers did not seem cool. Sloan definitely seems like he has it out for him. Yeah. And let's find out where he goes <gasps> in chapter 10, Flight of Destiny. Aragon races back to the farm to tell Garo and Safira about all the shit that just went down in Carvajal. And he makes the fateful choice to tell Safira first. And then he thinks he's going to reveal her to Garo. It's a tough look for Aragon because as soon as he mentions the strangers, like kind of imparts to Safira with their mental connection what they were like. Yeah. Safira loses her shit. She and, freaks out. Yeah, basically kidnaps him on their first flight together, which is, I mean, that's kind of a milestone. It's the first time he's riding his dragon, but also it's a bad situation. It's different than I thought how that would go. <laughs> yes, for sure. She's essentially overwhelmed by panic and rage at the strangers. Aragon can feel that a little bit through her. Mm -hmm. um, so that definitely seems like something we might want to keep an eye on. <laughs> Her exact thoughts we get from Aragon are fire, enemies, death, murders, oaths betrayed, souls killed, eggs shattered, blood everywhere, murderers. So, you know, nothing nothing to see here, really. Yeah, just a big TBD on that seems <laughs> fine. But we do find out that Aragon's real battle in this story is going to be with his greatest foe of all, motion sickness. <laughs> it's such a bummer. He vomits over the side of Safira on their very first flight together because <laughs> this little tum-tum's upset. Yeah. Uh, so magical. <laughs> <laughs> Just vomit. Yeah, a mess. Ugh. But Aragon cannot get through a mental wall that Safira puts up after uh -huh. that tirade. Um, so she's flying. He can't get through to her. And this is new. Like, we yeah. didn't we didn't know that they could put their, like, mental situation on silent. Yes. But that's, yeah. like, crazy. <laughs> Turn off the beepers. Yeah, it's Do like not call vibrating. me, beat me, if you want to reach me. <laughs> and it's so weird. He's trying to get her to turn back to the farm because he does still need to tell Garrow, warn Garrow. Yeah. Um, and she can't hear. So they end up going way too deep into the spine, which is a problem. Yeah. And Aragon gets injured because it's a long bareback flight. His legs get absolutely shredded by yeah. Safira's scales. And night's rapidly falling in this remote, foreboding mountain range that we know is fucking spooky. Yeah. When Aragon gets Safira to share their mind meld again, they get in their first fight because Aragon is pretty understandably, well, I think, yeah. pissed. I'd be pissed too. He's literally been kidnapped. So he's injured. He's helpless. He's stranded out in the mountains until morning. So he demands some restitution from Safira in the form of shelter for the night. <laughs> He's he, like, you give me cuddles, yes, all right? <laughs> yeah. He built her all those tiny homes when she first hatched, and now it's time for him to get his due. She, like, <laughs> curls up and shelters him with her wing so that he doesn't uh, freeze to death in the mountains overnight. <laughs> yeah, that's... It is kind of cute, but it's on the tail end of, like, this really tense situation. Yeah. Which culminates in chapter 11 the doom of innocence uh aragon, ominous yeah it does not bode well uh <laughs> aragon wakes to pain and the realization that he's like where Saphira's egg landed when yeah, he found her that's crazy yeah it's crazy and so first we learn that she can go into his memories and remember things that aragon has never told her which i like can't decide <laughs> if i think that's cool or super invasive yeah um i'm just like thinking of like Anyway, uh, more pressing if you remember that 
like spot well over two days walk through the spine from Carvajal, yeah. plus the 10 mile walk oh my God. <laughs> to Carvajal. Aragon is also totally messed up and very hurt. Mm -hmm. So he is justifiably pissed here. He even tells Safira that she's letting fear control her actions and he's not wrong. Here. Yeah. I had to say, it's funny. He's like kind of trying to neg her. <laughs> yeah, he kind of is. And I kind of feel for Aragon. He's mostly been kind of a dopey teen um in these early chapters here and that's gonna end any day now and i think uh, i would be mad too his father uncle uh by the time like by this time could be arrested or tortured or yeah killed. With sloan out here just fucking running his mouth yeah that man's a bean farmer <laughs> all he knows is lagoons not like tai chi or i don't know what he knows actually maybe he's a super yeah hero. garrow's in trouble if yeah. sloan's gonna tell the strangers where the farm is yeah so anyway uh it's not cool to not give garrow a heads up uh aragon convinces Sophia to bring him back to the farm she flies low and fast to get there by noon aragon finds the barn burned to the ground already yeah and they land in between oh. Sophia being very large now and aragon being much stronger stronger somehow and this is like new information kind of cool is this from the bond like yeah. why is he stronger anyway he's strong enough to move heavier stuff than he like thought he would be and he finds an unconscious and mostly unclothed Ugh. garo who is gray and feverish gray is not a color you want to be i don't think especially I don't think for gara who already looks like what is it described as like a stack of sticks on top of each <laughs> other or yeah a bundle of sticks wrapped in <laughs> shredded cloth gray is probably not the look but he, he's clearly been beat he's covered not mm -hmm. burns and is secreting like white pus oh. that smells like rotting fruit <laughs> yeah it's disgusting yeah uh aragon makes a litter and safira flies them both for a time but she she can't get them all the way to carvajal which is 10 miles <laughs> uh um, so Aragon, who is who hasn't eaten or drank anything for over 24 hours and who's injured himself, starts to pull his father uncle um, to Carvajal. Like up the road on yeah. their little makeshift. Yeah, and this treasure. is why it's dangerous to live 10 miles outside of town. <laughs> uh, the last moment in his in this scene is when he can make out the town is about to pass out when Brom. Regular old storyteller Brom mm -hmm. comes into his vision running his direction. Like he knows something's up, that he, guy? Yeah. So, Jess, now, now that we go through everything that actually happened in these chapters, what is your analysis this week? Okay. I feel like a newscaster. Like, thanks, Dane. And, Let's jump in. And now, <laughs> Jackie with the analysis. It's time for analysis. Yes. But seriously, this section of chapters had a couple of things jumping out at me as recurring ideas. On the one hand, a lot of these events tie back to the sense of protection. We have Aragon protecting baby Safira, Roran trying to improve his station in life to protect his hopefully future wife. Aragon trying in vain to protect Garo, Safira finally growing capable and large enough to protect Aragon, although kind of we'll see misguidedly yeah. <laughs> um and sloan protecting exactly nobody besides sloan <laughs> so that's it the tracks yeah that's yeah. him and brahm actually protecting aragon everywhere all the time <laughs> that guy solid solid dude yes but more than that um i noticed the other thing in this section kind of connecting the theme of emotional turmoil kind of in several of the characters plot lines everybody's just very in their feelings here we're still getting to know Aragon as a character, and I think in the early part of this section, he feels almost a little one-dimensional emotionally. There's obviously his wonder and excitement about his new companion, tempered a bit by the anxiety that people might find out about her. Yeah. But at the beginning of Chapter 7, in this section finally, we hear about Roran's big plan to leave Carvajal. Our picture starts getting like a little more complicated finally, a little more complex for yeah, Aragon. Things aren't as black and white. Yes, he's yeah. having some feelings. <laughs> he isn't able to grapple with and express his sadness about Roran's departure, and it manifests as sullenness, frustration, anger. He's going full emo kid teen angst. <laughs> yeah. And there's something that's really kind of tragic about watching Aragon misplace all these emotions to the point that in the last weeks he's spending with his brother cousin, they're barely talking at all. Yeah, it's like this last moment he has and they're not even sharing it. Yes. Like when, yeah. when they separate ways in Carvajal, um, Roran, <laughs> they're standing in the street and Aragon's like, okay, peace. And Roran's like, wait, you're not going to like, wait till I actually go. Cause Roran's not leaving yet. Aragon just leaves. He's yeah. the first one. And he's like, you can't dump me if I dump you. Yeah. He's like, no, nah, man, I got stuff to do. <laughs> yeah. It's so weird. And you're just like, okay, that's a kid who's running from his problem. Yes. And for his part, actually, Roran seems to be also struggling with his emotions about his departure. His final exchanges with both Aragon and Garrow can read almost as like curt and detached, but 
the good thing is Christopher Pellini gives us a little more insight through Roran's like movements and actions. Um, remember he was described as being like careful with his movements. I yeah. think that's meant to say like, okay, read into this stuff a little bit. He's a thinker. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> but he wants to pack like a stone Aragon had given him when they were kids, oh. like, and take it with him on his journey. He turns back for like a last glimpse of the farm when they're on the road. It's nice. It is like very <laughs> rom com though. It I is a say. little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, he he might just be hesitant on like how to show his dad and brother cousin that he's sad to be leaving them, even though he's excited about taking steps to kind of secure his future. And even shady ass Garrow gets in on emotional turmoil with his blessing to Rorin and his speech to both of the boys. This is actually where I started to soften on Garrow finally, because that brand of like quiet, dignified emotion feels very real to me for a tough farm dad. Like that actually, I think is kind of a realistic portrayal for what he's supposed to be, you know, still yeah. waters, hidden depths. It all makes of that. sense given everything else we know. It, yeah. it makes him less creepy. Yes. Yeah. But Aragon really is the star, star writer on the emotional roller coaster. And at the end of the section, we see him really confronting some big stuff for the first time. He's clearly terrified for Garrow, for Safira, the farm, for himself, after he hears what Sloane said. But the only way he can channel that heavy emotion is not by, you know, processing it, talking about it. That's for healthy people. He just has a huge blow up at the closest being to him is Dragon Safira. And as he makes his way back to the farm, he's just doing the most to repress and ignore his feelings to the point that as he's investigating like the burned out shell of his childhood home, he doesn't even know what crying is or that he's doing it. What? Yes. So <laughs> it's one of the like things also, two big iconic moments yeah. in this section that I just endlessly laugh about in this book. When Safira finally brings him back to the farm, he sees that it's destroyed. Uh -huh. All he's done so far is avoid things and yell at his dragon. Right. And he lands, and I'm going to read it just because it's kind of insane. Okay. It says, several tracks were before him, but his vision was blurry and he could barely see. Am I going blind? He wondered. <laughs> <laughs> With a shaking hand, he touched his cheeks and found them wet. It's like, you don't know you're crying? <laughs> Tears. You've never cried before. Oh my God. <laughs> Truly insane. <laughs> but this exploration of emotional turmoil for our characters definitely reads to me like like a piece in this whole coming of age story. It's yeah. a part of that. He's Growing 15. up. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um some of this angst and confusion can make it pretty easy to clown on Aragon. Obviously, I can't help it. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's what we're doing right now. Yeah. It's hilarious. <sighs> What are these tears? Am I going blind? <laughs> My dude. But overall, it feels very authentic for the way that you, anybody struggles through complex emotions as they grow up. Yeah. And I know you talked a little bit at the very beginning about how close knit Carvajal is, you know, how it's that feudalistic, we have to rely on each other society. Yeah, if we don't have stuff, we won't have stuff till next season thing. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And before we get into your deep dive, I just wanted da, 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 to... The deep dive! <laughs> That's the one, yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to talk a little bit about how effectively, like, that grounds this fantasy world in something that feels reminiscent, like, of a real time period in our world. I know in a past life, Dane, you were... A history teacher. <laughs> I was a social studies teacher yes. yeah, for middle school kids. I worked with uh, 13, 14, and 15 year olds. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, I guess for you, like, as we get these like strangers in town, as you know, we have the villagers turning on one another. Yeah. Is it feeling like people are right to be this heightened, this panicked? Like, oh, yeah. I think when you come in, a, like, a, I don't know. I, I, I think when you are in a community where you're at risk and you don't have a lot of agency or rights, you're less willing to protect people sometimes. It could go either way. I think you're more willing to protect people because you know there's a lot more at stake. But I also think I can see Sloan just being like, hey man, look, it was the kid. I don't know. Are you a Sloan apologist? No. Is that what I'm finding? <laughs> you heard it here first. I just love Sloan. I love Eek. me. I love me a butcher That's a with a temper. bad take. I don't know. A man who can work meat. There's something about that. <sighs> And now for the deep dive. Deep dive. Deep dive. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, we're going to learn about the races of Alagazia because we learned about them in these chapters. We learned some details about them. Yeah. Uh, there are five races, the dragons, the elves, urgles, dwarves, and humans. 
Of those races, dragons are the only natives of Algazia, I guess. Uh, dragons never stopped growing, and some were much larger than whole houses. Yeah. Um, dragons came in all sorts of colors, can breathe fire from their mouths after six months, and are intelligent and wise. Yeah. Um, elves are more graceful than other races, and a long, a very long time, like, they live for a very long time. Oh, okay. Yeah. And they have, like, a lot of experience. Anyway, they have pointed ears. The elves sailed to Algazia a long time ago from a place called Al- Alalia? Ala- Al- Alalea? Alalea? Yeah, that's definitely it. Alalea. <laughs> There's no way to know. <laughs> There's Kevin, no way to know that information. We definitely could not listen to the audiobook. No, no, no. And find out. Al-Alea. We definitely haven't listened to the audiobook No, no, no. I haven't times. listened to that audiobook. Gosh. LOL. <laughs> Urgles came to Algazia <laughs> following the elves in future and fought the future riders. Um, humans came to Algazia. They were added to the riders eventually with the elves. I don't know how that happened. I'm interested in that. Amazing that Brom just knows all of this. And it's just the storyteller has yeah. the stories, man. <laughs> uh, dwarves exist and they seem to be similar to other fantasy dwarves. Uh, and since Galbatorix has taken over, not one has been seen um, when it looked like Gal was going to win. They sealed themselves up in their mountains, apparently. Well, like you do. Classic. I mean, the way Galbatoric sounds, I would. <laughs> the Dragon Riders history is really the history of the dragons and the elves. We're going to talk about the dragons now. Dragons were the true natives to Alagazia and have been here as long as this place has existed. Basically, the land is one with the dragons and the dragons are one with the land, that whole thing. Yeah. The elves, on the other hand, sailed to Alagazia a long time ago. Um, once these two races were living in the same place, though, things pretty much took a turn for the worse, like, right away. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, Immediately at it's odds. It's pretty quick. A young elf man stalks and hunts a dragon like you would an elk and kills a dragon. This is a, <laughs> like this immediately, like the dragons respond by killing the hunter and more elves to really get the point across. Yeah, like, they're don't like mess with us. Double down, triple down. Yeah, they're we're like, gonna retribution will be swift. Yeah. It will be outsized. Yeah, we're gonna get back at you. You shouldn't have done that. Yeah. And the elves are really bummed out about this misunderstanding as it um must become clear these dragons have thoughts and feelings. Um, but they can't find a way to communicate with the dragons to apologize and make peace. And the elves at first just let the dragons kill them every now and again, which seems pretty nice of them. <laughs> and they don't want to turn the conflict into a full-blown war. But eventually the savage dragons kill one too many elves, <laughs> and the elves start a war with them that lasts for five years. Yeah. Then after brutal. five years, yeah, it's like a brutal bloody war. Um, then after five years, an elf named Aragon. No. Yeah. Finds a dragon egg, mysteriously left uncared for. Mm-hmm. He takes it and raises his dragon. It's called Biddom. Cool name. Yeah, it's pretty cool. And together they broker a peace between elves and dragons. Biddom talking to the dragons and Aragon speaks to the elves. And this is when they decide to make the, the writers, I guess. This way there would be an organized group of elf and dragon pairings that would keep peace between the races. Yeah, if yeah. there's like an incentive for them essentially to cooperate for the rest of eternity... The thought is, the going theory is that they won't have time to have war. <laughs> yeah, they won't mess with each other. Yeah. As time went on, the riders were given more respect and authority over uh, the dragons and the elves. They made a home base on the island of Vroengard, which is a dope thing to say. Vroengard. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> and built their own city called Doro Oriba where they had more power over the people of Algazia than any king yeah. and ruled over the empire twice as large as the current one. Things were better back then. <laughs> uh, what are you talking about? Yeah. Galvatorix has got things handled, Dane, that, except true. for like, you don't need to take care of all the people. There's got to be a reasonable explanation for yeah. all of this. Seems <laughs> normal. Seems Just totally fine. fine. Most, uh, most likely because of the dragons uh, and 300 years after 300 years, Humans came to Algazia and were added into the Riders. The dwarfs don't seem to be connected to the Riders for some reason, or the Urgles. Yeah. Um, and I guess the Urgles followed the elves to Algazia and mm-hmm. were were killing Riders. At, I don't know. At it, will they like immediately came and had beef? Yeah, it sounds like the Urgles came and just had beef with everybody. I don't. That's not like unclear. Yeah, that is funny too. I feel like that's one of those like oh, in a reread, you kind of pick up on oh, what you mean? They just followed the elves from where? Like that's a weird thing to. Just like out of nowhere. And anyway, the elves <laughs> call the dragon rider a shirtigal. Uh, so that's, I guess, the the elven way. It's the proper way. Oh, my God. It's a shirtigal, not dragon rider. Oh. You're an elf supremacist, Dane. Yeah, oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, we know that the rider's lives were extended to that of the dragon's lives, meaning that they had very long lives or lived forever. It's unclear so yeah. far. 
Uh, they were faster, stronger, more graceful than regular elves or humans, and they even had better eyesight and were quicker thinkers than normal. Yeah, they got in to get that LASIK. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> like, I want it. the brain boost. That would be dope. Yeah, uh, <laughs> that's true. Yeah, I'm like, yeah, just like look better, see better. <laughs> I'm clearly fixated on just a couple things here. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. Uh, finally, we know the writers who are humans started to get pointed ears, but not full elf ears. So little half elves, baby. Okay. All right. Yeah. That's all I got. That's my deep dive. I like it. I think it is interesting to hear it all put together like that. I feel like there's so much that is a little disparate as you're going through it, or just maybe that I glazed over as a kid being like, yeah, 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 yeah. Dragon's magic. You're like, cool, move cool, on, cool, move cool. on, move on. Yeah. But going back and rereading, I'm like, damn, Brom knows everything. That's a lot of stuff to know. <laughs> yes. And, and it's interesting. I feel like we get so much more up front in the early chapters of this book than I remember. Like, there's some stuff here with implications later on. Yeah, it's funny. I always, every time I read this book, I'm always like, oh, it's like right off the bat, we start learning stuff about this world and yes. about all of this. Yeah, it's the crazy. world building is, I mean, always one of my favorite things in a fantasy book. Maybe my favorite thing, if I had to pick one. <laughs> yeah. But I think I think Christopher Paolini does it really well, and it's really fun, and I love that we get so much of it from the jump. From this old storyteller, just a regular old guy. <laughs> regular dude. <laughs> and now we're at the segment, what are the haters saying? Hella stain. Yeah. Um, actually, you do your research, well, you huh? Have you even read the book? You pronounce this what are the haters the saying? No, there is an bad. index in the back, right? This is a really real just a copycat. Well, this week, for what, the, for what the haters are saying, uh, let's break down the comparisons from Star Wars and Aragon, as well as some from Lord of the Rings and Aragon. We're okay. just going to continue this on. This week, we have two. Uh, the mysterious thing that Aragon found was a dragon, which is for sure something the leader of the evil empire would not want him to have. This is very similar to having a droid with secret Death Star plans on it. Yeah, you know? See that makes the- sense. So, Sephira is R2-D2? R2-D2, D2, yeah. Okay. Uh, already... Yeah, kind of. I don't know. Swing? Yeah, it's a swing. White and blue? R2-D2? Yeah, he's white and blue. Okay, so don't at blue. me. Nobody come for me. Yeah. <laughs> so is Sephira. She's yeah. blue and she has white claws, I would presume, yeah. and horns and stuff. Anyway, uh, we already we have Brom. He's a wise old man who lives alone and doesn't seem to have a job, who <laughs> shares with Aragon. I'm guessing old storyteller doesn't pay much. You know I don't I mean? know. <laughs> jobs are for suckers Dane look yeah, at us yeah, exactly. we're here doing, we're a, doing podcast. a podcast <laughs> I like yeah what a criticism of a person yeah why would job. they just sit around telling the stories that's dumb wow anyway uh, <laughs> this is our podcast about stories uh, <laughs> and doesn't seem to have a job who shares with Aragon knowledge about the writers Obi-Wan was an old man who lived in the desert who also had a lot of information about the Jedi very similar I would mm-hmm. say so it, it is fair I, I don't know so far Brom seems very different to me, um, but we'll see how that goes. Uh, for the Lord of the Rings connections, I would say we confirm that there is an orc analog at this point. Um, we have the evil Urgles who just seem to be a blanket evil creature Monsters, at this point. Yeah. yeah, They're like even physically similar. They have, mm-hmm. you know, they're hairier, they're bigger, they have horns. I mean, orcs don't have horns, but there's a similar monstrosity type thing going yeah. on here. They, they actually remind me a lot of Trollocs from Wheel of Time. Yeah. Who that's, are also bestial and like violent yeah, I feel humanoids. Like that's a maybe closer analog. Yeah. So orc like bad race. We also have the classics like the Lord of the Rings. They seem like descriptively similar here. Classic dwarves who hide alone in the mountains. The very graceful and uh, like wise elves who live in the forest yeah. and even come from the sea. That's exactly like the elves from the Lord of the Rings. Again, I, none of this to me as of yet sounds like anything other than like basic fantasy you could find in a lot of sci-fi yeah. um, and fantasy novels. Uh, being fair though, that is, that's what I caught here. Yeah. Uh, those, I feel like they're reasonable comparisons for me in a book like this, especially something that is so deeply grounded in the fantasy genre. Yeah. These are tropes essentially at this point of fantasy, like sure. Lord of the Rings maybe did it first or did it best, but there's a reason these things have even crossed over to the world of like gaming fantasy they just are well yeah i was gonna say all of these are core races of dungeons and dragons except except for urgles right urgles aren't but like everything else but they're orcs yeah and gary (laughs) and gary gygax like never stole from anybody no 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 no. that guy was all (laughs) above board (laughs) so that's all the airtime i'm giving to the haters this week i think you know i don't know that's my final thought on the haters yeah i think i think the stuff can be similar but i'm just i don't care (laughs) 
Yeah, I, I don't, don't think th- it's taking anything away from me or for me. And no. I guess when you look at, for me, really take like Wheel of Time into mm-hmm. account and people, I mean, you have a Mount Doom in Wheel of Time. You yeah. have the Trollocs, which are just orcs, like very, very, very similar stuff yeah. between Wheel of Time and Lord of the Rings. And people kind of talk about it yeah. in a way that's like almost loving. <laughs> you like know, they're like, oh, okay, Robert. Yeah. And Robert Jordan talked about it in a way that was loving. Yeah. And so, and those novels are obviously, hopefully it goes without saying for anybody listening to this podcast, obviously widely beloved. Yeah. And he doesn't get shit about it. I think the way... Christopher Paolini does. So I'm like, <laughs> no. And the thing is, is like in the wheel of time, that whole first book, you know, Moraine's Gandalf, there's a lot of that stuff. I think, I think that whole first book is essentially Lord of the Rings. Um, it's that a good general, story. It's a good story. To borrow a phrase, Dane, it slaps, <laughs> but no one is, no one is, you're right. No one's like decrying that story the way they are. About this, this book. book, yeah, people you know? really get heated. They get heated about it. I think just like it's fine, everybody, calm down. Well, I guess what I would say is like haters. Yeah, we see it, we hear you. There is similarities. No one's denying that. Yeah, like I just think like so what? Yeah, you know what I mean? Like so what? So what? Hate? So what? Haters? <laughs> yes. Yeah. I feel I'm right there with you on yeah. that. So wrapping up this this episode, yeah. how are you feeling about this section? Ready to? Ready to keep it moving? Get yeah. to our next group of chapters? Yeah, I am. I'm also like super excited. I, you know, I always remembered loving Brahm. So I hope that pans out as we yeah. go forward. I love Safira. I'm glad she's in more of the book finally as like a character. Yeah. You know what I mean? I am really worried about Garo because uh, as much. <laughs> <laughs> Are you? <laughs> well, because like he's so creepy. What is he? Is he going to like turn into something or like, oh. is he? I don't know. He's just creepy. To Interesting me, huh? so thought. I'm, it's more of like, I'm not worried for his health. Oh. I'm more worried like. <laughs> it's God like, forbid yeah, he'd be worried about a, a nice man's health. I'm just kidding. I like Garo. He's nice. He turned it around. Did he? He turned it around. He tried. He gave some good advice. I think for me, I'm definitely, (laughs) (laughs) I feel like I'm definitely feeling like the scope and the pace of the book so much more in this section of chapters where, you know, first episode, that section we talked about a lot of exposition, meeting characters, got to do it (laughs) in the beginning of the book. Yeah. And we still obviously are getting a lot of world building here, like I said, which I love. But for me, that's kind of making it faster paced. It's obviously a lot more action already. We've burned down the barn. So (laughs) definitely, yes, definitely action. And then I think the world building now is in that in that vein that's fantastical that feels like, oh, we're expanding on something and it's getting, it's getting exciting. It's getting real. I can't wait to find out more. Yeah. I love it. And uh, thanks for joining us again. That looks like it's as that's all for this week. Uh, make sure to rate and review, especially on Apple podcasts <laughs> and check out our social media. You can check us out on our social media at is this just fantasy pod on TikTok or at just fantasy pod on Insta and Twitter. Dane, you're getting so, I mean, you were, Actually, from the jump, pretty good at that. I don't oh, know yeah? if you had a past life in like no <laughs> marketing radio promo, but I just talk a lot. It's that's real, <laughs> <laughs> but it's slick. Uh, if you would like to keep pace and read along with us for next week's episode, we will be covering chapter twelve, Death Watch, through chapter seventeen, Thunder Roar and Lightning Crackle. See you next week. Yes. Come on and listen to us next time Find out what our deep dive will be Thanks for catching our show